Game of Thrones Season 1, Episode 8, The Pointy End. I am back, Bo Oliver, the Blue Cricket, here with Aaron, the Animated Monkey. How you doing, Aaron? Great. Cool. Well, you usually yell at me when I get too in-depth. You're like, all right, relax. So I keep it one one word, simple. I don't know why you're screaming. It's really embarrassing in front of the in front of the kids, the children, the fans that are watching. You just want to uh, review Tomb Raider instead? Not really. Yeah, it wasn't that good. It was okay. I'm looking forward to the sequel, though, Womb Raider. It's where Lara Croft goes back in time and tries to kill baby Hitler before he's born. <laughs> That'd be good, right? That's a movie. That's a franchise. More of a film. It's an art house think piece on, you know, just life. Yeah, would you kill a baby if you know he's going to be evil? It's like, oh, look how cute he is. I think the right answer is, like, you steal the baby and, like, raise it to be good. Use that power for good? Yeah. Good Hitler? Oh, my good God. Hitler. This is the, this is, all right, let's get into this. <laughs> Uh, the pointy end. Now it begins where it kind of left off, where it's the massacre of the Stark men throughout the Red Keep, and it begins with Sirio and Arya training. So you know that right away, Arya has n- no idea really what's going on, and it's sad because you could see the Stark men that they're loading up the crates to go back to Winterfell, and one of the guys is like, "Oh, if you drop that, the Scepter's gonna have my head stabbed in the stomach." Yeah, they're getting pretty, uh, pretty banged up, and they're not taking any prisoners. No, no, it's just kill them all. Yeah, I, and I like just before like. They get uh, ambushed by the Lannister men. Like, Sirio's, like, teaching Arya her, his final lesson, pretty much. Because, you know, he ends up dead. I know a lot of people... Does he? Ugh, I know a lot of people, like, struggle to admit it, but yeah. I like to imagine he tap dance on all of them. Well, Meryn Trant is still alive, so that kind of confirms that Yeah, he's but, he, but yeah, he's talking to her about, like, how everything is not fair and de- deception's all around you. Kind of like his last lesson to Arya. When she's saying, oh, he said right, but he went left or something like that. He's right. like, oh, no, but my eyes told the whole story yeah and she becomes one of the most ruthless members of the stark family where she doesn't let honor get in the way of doing what she feels is right to protect her and her family but serial pharrell man what a swordsman mm. tap dancing on all these guys the moves man the subtlety the swiftness the i like grace. when he grabs the other guy's cape yeah <laughs> yeah and he's fending the other guys off with his wooden sword <laughs> It's like the cartoon when you have some put your hand on somebody's head and they're like running. <laughs> yeah. And also we see Septim Mordain where I like I like this too because it's not her trying to protect Sansa, it's her trying to shield her from what is about to happen because they're going to take Sansa prisoner and just kill Septim Mordain right in front of her. So it's not like, "Oh, go back to your room, protect yourself." It's, "I'm about to die. You don't need to see this right now." Um and she gets intercepted by the Hound, and this is really the beginning of that kind of awkward and tense at times in the books, even sexual relationship that they have. Uh, it, it's a strange relationship, but it's one that has resonated with the fans. They go too far with that. It's it's makes me sick. Well, George has even admitted that he he plays with that a little bit. Which, But the Hound is, is a lot younger in the book. Yeah, I know. And it's, it's you know, medieval times. Yeah, true. I like how they do it in the show, though. It's more that, that awkward relationship where it manifests into the Hound actually trying to want to help her at the end. But we'll get to that in season two. And... Yeah, and that goes right into Arya getting her first uh, body. Yeah, <laughs> out of the way. And I always wondered if she actually did kill this kid because you know, little needle to the stomach. I mean, I... Cal got a scratch and he's toast. <laughs> yeah, that is true. <laughs> yeah, it, it's almost inevitable what she's going to become, and this scene kind of exemplifies that. It's kind For of like she... the first experience, like normalizing, like killing to survive. Right. It's yeah. something that she does, and it's unintentional. I mean, and well, that guy was—he's be- being a, kind of a dick. Oh, well, he was trying to get Harrenhal. <laughs> he was trying to get a lordship. He probably definitely would have got Harrenhal. Yeah, yeah, 100%. He's like, oh, I'm going to become the lord of Harrenhal. A big-time dog. <laughs> and then Varys visits Ned in the dungeons. And I always wondered, what, was, what were Varys' intentions by talking to Ned here? What was he trying to do? Was he trying to get Ned to survive, to really admit his guilt and try and take the black? Was he trying to protect Ned here? I think he's always respected Ned and... I think, yeah, because when Joffrey ultimately decides to take his head, you know, he's one of the ones protesting against it. I think Varys could come off to a lot of people as kind of like a, you know, a bit of a snake, the master of whispers, the spider. But I think deep down, he really does care for, like, genuinely just honorable people. I think he's just trying to do his, his little bit he can to help because he mentions that, you know, he's not a warrior before when Ned questions... uh Varys about him not doing anything when he there's men are being slaughtered. Like Ned, what's Varys gonna do? <laughs> do you want him to stand up and just start taking on the Lannister men for, for uh like Ned still can't fathom somebody not doing something honorable and <laughs> he's in the dungeon and Yeah, and he asks him who does he truly serve? And Varys says, I serve the realm, somebody has to. Which I always go back and forth on which characterization I like better. 
Varys in the show or Varys in the books? Because you mentioned a while back that it's interesting that Littlefinger and Varys are like two sides of the same coin, um, where Varys will go to great lengths to protect the realm. He'll do some evil stuff, but he's not necessarily inherently evil. In the books, I think he is. I think he's he's more Littlefinger than he is Varys on the show in the books, where his motivations are very personal. Well, it's easy to process Varys as him being a Daenerys supporter than in the books him being a young Griff supporter. Yeah. I feel because like Daenerys is viewed to the but audience. But I don't think he's a Targaryen loyalist. I think he's a loyalist to anybody he feels would be the best ruler at that time. It depends. It depends on really on the book perspective if young Griff is a Targaryen or not. Cause yeah, that, in the book, I think he, well, yeah. it's Then that changes like his motivation depending on who or not he is. And I love this little line too when he says, you know, Arya escaped the castle. Uh, even my little birds don't know where she is. <laughs> this Arya is a... Uh, yeah, you're off the map if that's the case. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then we go north and it's the Night's Watch examining the dead body. And I love how Sam speaks up in this scene and they're all surrounding the body and Sam's like, where's the smell? Where's the rot? If these bodies have been dead for a couple of days, there should be a smell. And Jior Mormon's like, Sam, you might be a coward, but you're not stupid. And I love that little grin that Sam gives. He's like, oh, well, look <laughs> at me. I'm doing stuff. So yeah, at this point, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, right? I'll take, I'm getting nothing. Take whatever I can get. And then John is informed by Gior Mormont about King Robert dead. Ned has been arrested for treason. And Gior says, don't do something stupid. And to John, that's like, oh, go do something stupid? Okay. It's impossible for the Starks not to do something stupid when they get emotional. It pisses me off, man. I, as much as I love John and his arc, I, I wish he was next to Rob this whole time. I always think about that too. Like if John would have just went south, met up with Rob, was like his second in command, and then would have got massacred at the Red Wedding. <laughs> no, he probably would have been like in Harren Hall or something. Oh yeah, yeah, Harren Hall, right? He would have went out to piss with uh, Blackfish. Yeah, he w- well, he wouldn't have been allowed in the halls because he was a bastard. Ooh, yeah. There we go. And then, and this is a scene um, when Cersei and the Small Council are trying to manipulate Sansa. What a bunch of fucking dicks. <laughs> fucking assholes in this scene manipulating this poor innocent girl Pys- screw over his fu- oh Pycelle's the fucking worst out of all of them <laughs> a traitor's seed <laughs> <laughs> shut up you old bitch <laughs> this is a letter that comes back in season 7 but you know when you're Sansa you're in this situation you're basically you're being led to believe that your father is a traitor you probably do believe Cersei at this time but that's well, still her father Well, she's still still caught up in the fairy tale life she's gonna learn quick that it's not all typed up to be. And I love how you, you could see Varys and Littlefinger subtly play the game in the background. Like they're trying, they're giving their two cents in on like what she should do. And there's little subtle movements like Varys calling Ned a traitor, even though he really doesn't believe that. And Littlefinger, you know, putting his two cents in. So Yeah, they're, uh, they're keeping up appearances, but they're trying to plant the seeds in Cersei's head, you know, yeah. go in this direction, go in that direction. And then the letter arrives at Winterfell. And th- this, to me, the dialogue in this scene when Rob's like, call the banners, and Lewin's like, all of them, my lord. <laughs> I get so hyped. Nah, Lewin gets hyped, too. I get hyped, too. I fucking, I wrote in my notes, Rob receives letter and calls his banner, parentheses, shit gets me hyped. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, have they pledged to my house? And like, they have, my lord. <laughs> well, let's see what their pledges are worth. And this is cool, too, because in this scene, Theon asks him if he's scared, and Rob has his hand is shaking and he's like I must be he's like good that means you're not stupid they kind of do a callback to this at the end of season 6 when it's Tyrion and Daenerys and Tyrion asks Daenerys are you afraid he's like well I I was expecting Theon in this scene to be like good you're in the great game now (laughs) and the great game is terrifying but it it is terrifying to be Rob in that situation you know you're a 16 year old kid you're still a boy really but you have to take on the burdens of being a man being the leader of the biggest chunk of the seven kingdoms and it would be terrifying. I mean, I wouldn't be able to do that. Yeah, and I like it. We'll get to it as we talk more about the episode. He's shown to be a strong leader right away, right off the bat. And he's still growing Very into confident it. in what he's doing. And there, there, there are moments of vulnerability where he still wants to revert to being a kid. And then at the Vale, Catelyn, well, at the Eyrie, Catelyn confronts Lysa about hiding the letter from her because Lysa wants nothing to do with this because we know that Lysa was the one who killed Jon Arryn. So she has no intention of sending the Knights of the Vale to fight with Rob Stark, and that really would have been the turning point in the war. If Rob had the Knights of the Vale, they crushed the Lannister army. So the Knights of the Vale, that's an elite force. It's a big get. You know, she's playing the game as well, and she's just, I hate her. She's not really playing the game as much as she's not going to do anything without Littlefinger giving her the go-ahead. Yeah, right. She's following orders, essentially. As in, don't do anything. (laughs) Um, My man Robin's still trying to get that titty milk. (laughs) Yeah, I'm hungry. (laughs) Jesus Christ, put it in a bottle. Sick fucks. And I love this too. Tyrion and Bronn just wandering through the veil, and Tyrion's whistling, and 
Brown's like, can you shut up? It every time they're together in like the first two seasons, it's like a comedy show. Uh, there's a video on YouTube where they add a laughing track to all their one-liners, and it's so good. Tyrion tells Bronn, if there's ever a moment where you feel like you want to sell me out, I'll match the price. I like living. Um, and then they're confronted by the Hill Tribes, and it's Tyrion showing once again that he's able to manipulate people and get on their good side. Yeah, he kind of like, you know, breaks down using like his wit and humor. When he has the line about, you know, how would you like to die, Tyrion, son of Tywin? He's like, at 80 years old, in my own bed belly full of wine and a woman's mouth around like it's you know that's not bad if somebody guaranteed me that you know you get to 80 this is yeah, how you go i'd sign up for that yeah i take that deal you take that deal and then it sets up their future relationship to your number on like you said before like whatever anyone else offers i'll i'll beat it and it just sets up that you know Bron being Tyrion's like sword getting all the perks that comes with being in the good graces of a lannister yeah he does well for himself he oh, really yeah. does. Best decision he ever made in his life. And Shaga, too, man. I mean, he, he has a big role in season two. That's the big three. And back north, Jon Snow, don't do anything stupid. Well, okay, I'm going to try and kill Alistair Thorne. <laughs> he straight up tries to kill Alistair Thorne in this scene. Alistair's like, oh, not only are you a bastard, but you're a traitor's bastard. He tried to fucking stab him. <laughs> <laughs> like, he straight up tried to murder him. Yeah. That's... And if it wasn't for Gior Mormon. He probably gets the death penalty. It's just, you know, wall guys doing wall stuff, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Those Northmen. Just, just guys being guys. Well, the there's wall. another Northman scene later that's in the, this That's episode. the wall's motto, you know? Stark has winter is coming. Wall's, you know, just guys being dudes. Guys being dudes. <laughs> Welcome to the wall. <laughs> yeah, just guy stuff, you know? <laughs> Gior puts him in timeout, confines him to his quarters. Yeah, he's lucky. <laughs> like, yeah, he is very lucky. Uh, and this is when Ghost can sense the presence of the white in Gior's quarters. And this is cool, you know, it's like ghosts, the direwolves are essentially magical beings. They're magical beasts in a sense. Um, so they, he can sense, and obviously it's that animal instinct. And this is when one of the main characters that we've been following, where we've known what the threat was from the very first scene, but now it's like one of the main characters is being introduced to an ice zombie, essentially. Yeah, it's the first, well, actually, no. The little girl is the first visual right, yeah. of a white we get, but this is the first time a main character sees an actual white. Yeah, and just basically, it confirms suspicions. So now they actually know this is out there. And Right, before it's been reports, but now it's just it's evidence. You know, I was lucky enough, grabs the lantern, sets him ablaze, and they find out, hey, maybe fire can stop these guys. Yeah, and he burns himself, so... Talk about changes from the books. I don't like, you know, why don't they talk about John's hand like George does? Every fucking chapter of every every That line. his hand burned? <laughs> Back in Essos, the first scene with Daenerys, and it's the first time that Daenerys is really witnessing the atrocities committed by the Dothraki, that these people are horrible, you know, they raid cities, they they sack them, they take their men and children as slaves, they rape their women, and Jorah says to Daenerys, you know, this is the life of the Dothraki, you have a gentle heart, and she's like, I do not have a gentle heart, sir. She doesn't, I mean... She's pretty badass in the later seasons. Well, it's funny because this is her first, like, I guess, direct experience, like, witnessing this stuff. But literally the episode before, Drogo was, like, mapping out what he's going to do to Westeros. Uh, rape their women, enslave their children. And she, and she was like, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, she's like, oh, I'm all for that. And when she and then, sees it, she's like, Ugh. It's one thing to hear it. It's another thing to actually see it. And she's um, kind of, I think she feels a little guilty, too, because she's indirectly responsible. Because they need money for ships. And that's why they're sacking all these cities, so. Right, she says, you know, I thought the Dothraki didn't believe in gold, and Jorah's like, well, he's trying to buy you ships so he can get your Iron Throne. Did you forget about that? And she has that back and forth with Mago, one of Khal Drogo's blood riders, saying that, you know, you if you're going to take these women, take them as wives. And Drogo ends up agreeing with Daenerys. He he talks about, oh, that's my son inside of her. You see how fierce she grows? Oh, yeah, he's loving it. And she's like the dragon feeds on horse and lamb alike. He's like, <laughs> yeah, hell yeah. Like, hell yeah. Wait, does that mean me? Oh, <laughs> uh, and then he spits at the at the feet of Drogo, and this is where we get to see Cal Drogo in his prime. Doesn't even use the knives; just completely evades him. Grabs the sword, cuts his neck, and rips out his fucking esophagus. It's good head movement too. Yeah, yeah, he's very elusive, like a Floyd Mayweather, you know, the head bob. Our first look at a uh, Miri Mazder. Not the best person to clean the wound, I would say. <laughs> Dave Daenerys should have probably got someone else, but hey, she holds a grudge. Yeah, did that wound really need to be clean, though? It's like, just get some, you know, soap and a rag. It's so inconsistent in, like, medieval, like, where a paper cut can kill you, or you can lose a limb and be all right. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, Jamie's fine, you know. I, I guess he did have a maester, so. 
And this is probably my favorite scene of the episode. All the Northmen are basically discussing their battle plans, and Great John Umber has a disagreement with Rob. If you don't let me lead the vanguard, I'm just going to take my men home. And Rob's like, fine, I'm going to go down south, kill King Joffrey, and then I'll come back and hang you as an oathbreaker. <laughs> I just love this because it's just typical Northman <laughs> behavior. <laughs> like, they're ready to, like, kill each other, and then Grey Wind just hops on the table when Great John pulls out the knife and attacks him, rips off his finger, <laughs> and Rob's like, oh, it's okay, Great John, Umber, Great John Umber was just trying to cut my meat for me, and he's like, Your meat? Is bloody tough. <laughs> <laughs> and they all just start fucking laughing. And I love the shot of Bran, too. He's like, eh, what's the going hell, on? What the hell's going on here? First of all, Vanguard, it's a shitty job. Why do you want to be on the front lines? Oh, is been, that what the Vanguard is? Yeah, I would have yeah. been okay with that. I'm like, yeah, let, let, let uh, Glover do it. Yeah, no, Glover's got it. He's good. He's good up front. I love how, like, in, I guess, Westeros, you can make people do shitty jobs by just saying it's very honorable. Yeah, that's, it's like an honor thing. Yeah, it's just, they just throw that on there. Like, yeah, it's very honorable if you do it because no one else wants to do it. So you have to spruce it up a little bit, even and though it's the worst fucking gig to have. If you pause this scene right here, you can see that Grey Wind is just a stuffed animal when he attacks great john they literally just threw a stuffed animal at him i think it's but it's so quick that you can't tell but if you pause it, it it's so funny yeah it's the first like it's rob just standing his ground like showing he's a capable leader he's not going to be taking shit from anyone yeah he has to command that respect i mean he has the name and that helps him but if he doesn't stand up to great john here then he can lose the entire room what a great character too i wish he stayed yeah i don't know why they got rid of great john he's got a lot of good scenes in this episode and and the episode couple of I episodes. I needed him at the Red Wedding. It took eight, so they say it took eight frays to take him down when he was blackout drunk. <laughs> <laughs> so He's like, like Scarface, man. Yeah. And in the next scene, Rob says goodbye to Bran. It's another sad farewell between brothers. Essentially tells Bran, you know, there always needs to be a Stark in Winterfell. You're commanding now. You're the Lord of Winterfell. Um, and Rickon, you see him hiding in the hallway and Bran is in turn trying to reassure his younger brother. Right away, he has to be the man of the castle, essentially. Uh, and Rickon knows the truth. He's like, nobody's coming back, dude. <laughs> like, they're, they're about to get their yeah, shit Rickon stopped. read the books. <laughs> yeah, he's a book reader. We have Osha going out to the Weirwood, where Bran's praying for his family. She tells him, hey, uh, you guys should be marching north. I mean, it's something that we hear throughout from the wildlings and, I guess, members of the wall. The real, the real battle's up north, and Rob's marching the wrong way. Yeah, we get nice little insight into the mythology of the northern gods. And she says, all the weirwood trees have been chopped down in the south, so Rob's going to have no help of the old gods where he's marching. How can you see without eyes? Those weirwood trees are fucking creepy, man. You know what's even creepier? Bran's probably watching. Him. I was just going to say that. <laughs> Every scene I watch, I'm like, Bran's definitely watching this. <laughs> and then back at the wall, we see them burning the body of the Night's Watchman who came back to life. And Sam talks about the White Walkers, that this man was probably brought back to life by the White Walkers because he read it in a book that they come back with blue eyes. He says, you know, I hope the wall is tall enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, talk about a book reader. I right, quit bragging about it, Sam. People on the internet never brag about reading the books. Well, you're in the books. Uh, and back south, Catelyn and Rob reunite. And this is the moment, too, where we see that vulnerability in Rob, where he sees his mom, and he's like, Mother! And then he realizes where he is. And, <laughs> mommy! Yeah. <laughs> oh, Mommy, can you make me a grilled cheese? <laughs> right away, he has to be like, mm, it, it, It's good to see you. And Catelyn senses this too, and she basically tells all the men to get out so they can have that embrace. Uh, and it's got to be hard for Catelyn, you know, seeing your firstborn son. He's still a kid, essentially, leading men into battle. They discuss their chances, you know, and Catelyn tells him, you know what happened to the Targaryen kids when the Mad King was killed? They were slaughtered in their sleep. If you lose, we all lose. We're all going to die. Makes things easier, right? Yeah, well, Rob's like, well, I guess we can't lose. It's probably one of the better relationships in the books, I feel like, and in the show, Cat and Rob. And she's like the first manifestation of that relationship in that tent when she reunites with him. And just looking back at these episodes, it's, it's quite sad. Because here you're just like, yeah, this is the only one option. You're going to go down, you're going to kill Joffrey, you're going to slap up Tywin, kill Jaime. And then it's Officer the Red Keep to free Ned. Yeah. No. No. <laughs> uh, and then another reunion between parent and child uh tywin and Tyrion. even in the scene you can sense the tension between them but um and Tyrion introduces him to the mountain clans and says that he basically needs to repay them and tywin convinces them to fight with him 
Tyrion's kind of getting updated on the whole situation here because he's been out of the loop. Yeah, the phone died for a while and he just got back on Twitter. Yeah, <laughs> sees yeah. all the shit that happened. It's like, oh shit, Syracuse is one again. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Wow, that was a big upset. Virginia, number one seed, yeah. 16 seed. <laughs> Trump uh, is president? What the f- <laughs> Tyrion trying to reach for the wine the whole time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Tywin's Tywin like... pulling it away. He's had a rough couple of weeks, Tywin. Let him have a glass of wine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right away, he's like, oh, Jamie wouldn't have let himself get captured. I love that, too, because in the next episode, <laughs> he, gets, <laughs> he gets fucking captured. <laughs> Really, this is Rob Stark making his first move where he bops the shit out of Tywin. He thinks that his entire force is going to attack Tywin Lannister at their camp, but it's only 2,000 men. And then he sends the 18,000 men to capture Jaime Lannister's army. So it's a great move by Rob. Everyone was sleeping on Rob, too. Yeah, Tywin in the scene, he's like, oh, one taste of battle, he'll go back to Winterfell with his tail tucked between his legs. And Tyrion's like, maybe. Yeah, it's again, you show his, his leadership capabilities, his, you know, strategic abilities, too. Sets it up where, like, at first, the Great John's like, what the, are you fucking crazy? Why'd you let him go? It's like, eh, relax. Relax, Great John. Right, yeah, this is the next GJ scene. GJ, as he likes to call him. GJ? Yeah. Oh, that's what he calls him yeah. on the side? I- informal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he shows mercy to the Lannister spy, but like you said, it's, there's something, there's a plan to it. It yeah. wasn't just because, you know, Rob is known to show mercy to people. That's the difference, really, between him and somebody like a Tywin Lannister. It's the first uh, reference of that all-important Frey Bridge. <laughs> yeah, right. The twins that are just so important to basically maneuvering throughout that area of the Seven Kingdoms, uh, especially in this war. And yeah, I, I, that's the next episode where they visit the Freys, right? Yeah. I always forget how much really happens in these next couple of episodes. Well, where there's a Ned lot is, going on in this episode. I feel yeah, like. where Ned is still alive for parts of this, for parts of the war in the very beginning. Because it always feels like the war really starts after Rob is crowned King of the North. But in this next scene, we see the um, the throne room. We're back in King's Landing. Yeah, it's a and first look at Joffrey as king, really. Yeah, and it's the first time Harrenhal is given out to somebody. <laughs> Janos, you want it? Got it. Harrenhal for life. Book it. You're definitely not going to be sent to the wall next season. And then Barristan and Selmy is dismissed by Cersei. Now, why do you think Cersei got rid of Selmy? Do you think she was afraid that Barristan was too honorable, don't want to keep him around? No, I mean, they're trying to set their people in place. They make Tywin Hand of the King and Jaime Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. Yeah, you can't do that with Barrison still there. You can't be like, hey, Barrison, you want to take, you know, a lesser position? You could have demoted him a little. He did let the king die. Well, I love that line, too, where Barrison's like, even now I could carve you up like a piece of cake. (laughs) Even now I could cut through the five of you like carving a cake. And everybody is so shook when that man takes out his sword. Even the Hound. The Hound is standing behind five members of the Kingsguard, and he grabs his hilt. He's like, I'm the last line of defense because he's about to fuck these dudes up. (laughs) (laughs) I I just love that respect for Barrison. And also the disrespect pisses me off. But I think in, in the books, Tywin Lannister really chastises Cersei and says, you know, maybe his skills were declining, but with Barrison, it's the name. Yeah. Everybody in the kingdoms knows who Barrison Selmy is. He's a legendary figure. If you have him on your side, that just creates more empathy for your cause. Um, Little figures joke. That was, you know, uncalled for. The man's already dead. I shall die. I might. <laughs> a naked knight, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, when he's, he says, well, you'll be a naked knife. Body's not even cold yet, and you're going to rip him down like that. <laughs> Littlefinger just can't resist. <laughs> and I love the laughing track of everybody in the throne room, too. This is a move that really comes back to bite them in the books, uh, in the show. It's I loved what Barrison did when he was with Daenerys, but... He can cut up five Kingsguard, like cake, and have the hound shook, but a couple noblemen with little knives. No, that's his weakness. Yeah. Everybody has a strength and a weakness. Um, and then Sansa steps up and pleads for Ned's life. She pleads for mercy. This is where Joffrey does promise mercy, but, you know, you can tell that that final shot when the throne is is coming up and engulfing Sansa, that it's ominous. Being lied to, being manipulated by Joffrey, who is going to end up torturing her and tormenting her. And you know, no one has, like, any common sense, like, when it comes to family. Like, oh, how could you still care about a traitor? Like, yeah, it's my fucking dad, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pycelle says that, right? Yeah, he's a douchebag well Pycelle is working he's in the bag for the Lannisters I know but it's just like even Cersei's like uh, before she's like oh you disappoint me 
It's like, what? she's a little girl. Let her, let her care about her father. Yeah, you could still manipulate her without yeah. probably being in your favor to let her care about her father, but say, hey, I know he's your dad, but he's a traitor. I think this is a really good episode. I would probably give this an 8.5 out of 10. Uh, it's a good setup episode to what's to come, um, because the next episode is one of the most iconic of the series. Yeah, I think it does a great job of setting up the last two episodes. It kind of, a lot happens where it moves a lot of different stories forward. We get to see the conclusion, episode 9 and 10, which I think are the two strongest episodes of the season. Well, that's it. That's end of the channel. We're shutting things down. And episode 8, season 1. Yeah, episode 8, season 1. This is the peak of Nerd Soup. Can't say I didn't see it coming. (laughs) We'll be right back.